Hello, everyone. Welcome to Palladium Magazine's Digital Salon with Michael Lind. I'm Wolf Tyvey, Editor-in-Chief of Palladium. I'm joined by Matt Allison, our Associate Editor. Hi, everyone. Our guest today is Michael Lind. Michael is a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. His most recent book is The New Class War, Saving Democracy from the Managerial Elite. Michael, welcome to the salon. Thank you for having me. We're joined by our live audience of Palladium members and friends. The conversation will be recorded and rebroadcast on YouTube and as a podcast. To become a Palladium member and get invited to upcoming salons, visit palladiummag.com slash subscribe. The plan is for Matt, Michael, and me to have a discussion for about half an hour and then move to questions with our live audience. So for the live audience, be sure to use the Q&A function in Zoom to post your question. Michael, your book is based on an analysis of a new class war where a global college-educated overclass has divided and disenfranchised everyone else, leading to immiseration and a populist backlash. Can you say more about this class war? What is it? How does it work uh, in your view? Well, that's a very good one-sentence summary. Uh, what we do in the new class war is I build on the thinking of people, including uh, James Burnham, who was mm -hmm. a of Trotsky in the 1930s, the leading U.S. conservative in the 1950s, uh, the uh, economist and social thinker John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, who argued that uh, the bourgeois phase of capitalism, that is, of the phase of owner operators, uh, had given way by the middle of the 20th century uh, to large scale uh, industrial corporations, uh, which were run pretty much by uh, the executives and the managers. And you still had very wealthy investors particularly with large companies, uh, you had uh, uh, corporate executives really had a great deal of autonomy. And at the same time, uh, you had the bureaucratization of philanthropy, of uh, higher education, uh, of government, you know, with, with proliferating government agencies. Uh, and the, so, so their argument, which I think was correct, is that the real key to social power in managerial societies, and Burnham defined them very broadly to include the Soviet Union, you know, you would include modern communist China and others. Uh, but the, the key to institutional, uh, to personal power and success is being in or near leadership positions in these huge bureaucracies, which may be public, private, or a nonprofit, as the case may be. And the, the main form of entry is a credential. It's a, high, it's a higher education. Uh, initially, a four-year college diploma, but because of credential inflation in the U.S., increasingly it's a, a, a graduate or a professional degree. And so, uh, uh, so there's a lot of dispute about this, but I think that it's act in this kind of society, in a managerial society, the possession of this uh, educational credential is the major marker of class. Uh, and it comes with all sorts of other things, including cultural attitudes and, and linguistic habits, uh, not simply money per se, uh, you know, so that you can have high school educated people who get rich, you know, through business or striking oil or something. And you can have shabby, genteel, uh, highly educated people. Uh, but for the most part, there's a, a close correspondence between advanced educational credentials and actual personal wealth and uh, income in the US and, and the similar societies of Europe. I just want to dig into that a little bit. In particular, how this managerial class sort of broke the power of the ownership class. Um, you know, you, theoretically, the shareholders of corporations have the power to you know, fire their management teams and replace them and, and discipline them and so on. So, you know, one theory would be that the managers actually don't have that much power within society because there's always these these nominal superiors to them that could theoretically discipline them. Can you go into a little bit about the institutional mechanics of, of how you see that they've actually ended up with a lot of power despite that? Yeah, yeah certainly. Uh, uh, Burnham in his uh, book in 1941, The Managerial Revolution, uh, uh, drew on the, uh, the book on the modern corporation by Adolf Burley, who was one of Franklin Roosevelt's advisors in Gardner Means, and they argued that with these giant corporations, you had fractionated, fluctuating stock ownership. Now, in theory, every shareholder is an owner of the corporation, 
But if you have thousands, you know, or, or tens of thousands of shareholders, and many of them, uh, if, if you have, let's say, retirement savings in a mutual fund, you don't even know at any given moment what corporations you have a share of, right? So, so it was partly, uh, and, and, and that goes back before Burnham, as I say, to uh, Burley and Means. They argued that this liberated uh, managers from oversight uh, of, of the kind that they had when these were more closely held uh, corporations. And in addition, and you can't generalize for every Western capitalist society, in the United States, the managers have entrenched themselves by appointing members of the board, right? And, and they can largely get their uh, cronies on the board to rubber stamp their salaries. And it's different in other countries. You have interlocking directorships in Japan. In Germany, there's still more of a tradition of bank-led uh, capitalism with banks on boards kind of supervising managers. But particularly in the United States, uh, managers are arguably very highly independent of, uh, of uh, uh, the stock market. Now, of course, they claim that they are forced to do all of the things that they are doing by the shareholders, right? And so this leads some, in my view, rather old-fashioned Marxists to say, oh, we'll see. It's like, you know, the, these uh, rich capitalists are actually dictating, you know, what the CEO of General Electric and Apple and so on do, right? They're just kind of you know, high ranking proletarian subalterns, uh, you know, and, you know, my problem with that is if you look at what U.S. corporate executives since the 70s and 80s uh, allegedly have been forced to do by Wall Street or by the shareholders, like massively increase their compensation, right, like offshore factory jobs, you know, to non-union low wage workforces in other countries, it kind of looks like it's what, what they would have wanted to do anyway, right? We see this pattern of sort of financialization and offshoring and, and abstraction that that actually does end up uh, entrenching the power of the managerial class, uh, even though it's sort of justified within this framework of, of profit for the shareholders. Yeah, so for that reason, I think it's kind of a mistake to say we had these innocent industrial corporations which are tyrannized by Wall Street, they're tyrannized. By, by the uh, stakeholders, uh, shareholders. I, I think they have much more autonomy uh, than they would like to admit. So let's look at the other side of that problem then, which is uh, how this managerial class is able to kind of discipline the political side of society in terms of dividing the, the much more numerous working class and, and everyone who's not kind of cut into this deal. Um, how, how does that division work? How have they kind of change the rest of society and by what means to, to sort of disenfranchise um, people in your view? Well, as I, I write in the new class war, uh, there were post-war social settlements, new deals in the US and in similar, uh, mostly Western European democracies. Uh, and they all involved this uh, already very powerful uh, managerial elite being uh, checked and balanced by mass membership organizations to which uh, that magnified the power of non-college educated working class people. And the three of most important of these organizations were membership parties, political parties, especially local political machines, uh, uh, churches, synagogues, other religious institutions, which were much more powerful in the 1950s and 60s than they are today. And last but not least, uh, private sector trade unions. And all three of these organizations that allowed working class people without much education to pool their power uh, for their interests, which were usually economically progressive in the case of the unions, <clears throat> often they were moderately social, socially traditional or conservative in the case of uh, churches. <clears throat> but, but they really did have power. You know, they could compel the uh, elite college educated managers to negotiate with them. And all three of those for different reasons. It wasn't a conspiracy by the elite. You know, the, the, these three institutions have declined for different reasons. Uh, the United States, as Europe did a generation ago, is becoming much more secular. So that's the main reason for the decline of religious institutions. 
that uh, system that you're describing, it's kind of the mid-century pluralism, you've called it in your book, democratic pluralism. Um, and, and you're sort of seeing that as kind of a coherent deal that was made at that time where, where you have all these uh, other more distributed power centers in society, like of workers, of, of uh, normal people's kind of social concerns and so on, that were able to act as a check against the, the sort of central uh, technocratic uh, overclass power. Yeah, that's right. And uh, the, the political party machines had been around in the U.S. since Martin Van Buren and the Jacksonian era, and they, they kind of disintegrated in the late 20th century as a result of party primaries and TV advertising and so on. The unions, to an extent I think the left is unwilling to acknowledge, were, were really empowered by the Roosevelt administration in World War II. Uh, both in World War I uh, in World War II, the Wilson and then the Roosevelt administrations uh, brought organized labor, which had really not been very successful, you know, uh, in organizing the workforce into the government, uh, not necessarily out of idealism, but because you didn't want work stoppages, you know, during the fights against Imperial Germany and then Nazi Germany and the uh, Axis powers. Uh, and in both cases, uh, the membership of uh, unions just ballooned during wartime, uh, it was rolled back by an employer counteroffensive uh, beginning in 1919 and then in the 1920s uh, after World War I. After World War II, uh, it lasted all the way up until the 70s and 80s before you, you had an employer counteroffensive roll it back. Michael, I was especially struck by what you wrote in uh, Chapter 5 where you compare counterculture that we have now in terms of populism to a counter-establishment, which might be more productive. If I might quote you, you write, today's populism is a counterculture, not a counter-establishment. A counterculture defines itself in opposition to the establishment. A counter-establishment wants to be the establishment. Members of a counterculture relish their outsider status. Members of a counter-establishment regret their outsider status. A counterculture is the heckler in the audience. A counterestablishment is the understood is the understudy, waiting in the wings for a chance to play the title role. I'm wondering, given that, how does the counterculture become a counterestablishment in in this sense? Well, well, this is the real challenge. It, it was a challenge for the left and also for the populist right in the U.S. That is, uh, you know, if you want. Uh, to have not simply charismatic leaders, you know, like Sanders on the left or, or Trump on the right, uh, but also what, what the uh, Soviets called cadres, uh, mm -hmm. 10,000 people sharing your views, whom you can, uh, the, whom a president of your party can appoint to all kinds of minor positions in the federal bureaucracy and independent agencies and things like that. Uh, you know, you, you have to have a career path for these appointees, whether they're on the left or the right, you know. Uh, otherwise, uh, you would be in the position which Donald Trump uh, uh, has been in, but I think if Bernie Sanders had been elected, he would be in a similar position, right? That is, you know, the, the vast majority of Trump's appointees, and the president in this country appoints thousands of people uh, to federal agencies. Uh, and, and the cabinet departments. Uh, there weren't that many Trumpists. Now, that may be a good thing, but there simply weren't that many. So his, his own White House, his own uh, cabinet was staffed basically by Bush, Romney, Ryan Republicans. And, and if uh, Bernie Sanders had become president, uh, you know, there'd be some, you know, uh, progressives, but, but a lot of the appointees would have been Clinton, Obama uh, retreads. So, so there had some kind of institutional home and career network to have a counter-establishment. That, that's very interesting. So so you're saying like if a, an outsider president wanted to come in and actually make some changes, what they really need is to have this cadre of, of you know, 10,000 people kind of in some career network able to step in and actually staff a government with with some coherent idea of what they would actually do. And that that would that's kind of what you're addressing to the question of of uh, how we might turn kind of a counterculture that's, that's just griping about problems to a counter-establishment that actually has some plan of fixing it. Yeah, that's right. But they, they have to have had 
some kind of public uh, service related careers before they go into government and they want to have you know professional salaries and and you know be able to pay for their their families and their college education i mean these are members of the managerial overclass who may be sympathetic to the working class but they're mostly college educated uh, and for you know clinton obama democrats and for bush republicans you have these institutions you know you have mainstream think tanks like Brookings, where you get kind of moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats. You have uh, the big law firms in DC. You have the big lobbying organizations. So when your party wins, you know, you can go into government. When your, your uh, president loses, you know, then you can go to K Street or you can go teach in the Ivy League, right? Or, or you can go work for a nonprofit or a think tank. Uh, and unless you have that kind of uh, infrastructure for dissidents, for people who deviate from this kind of very narrow bipartisan neoliberalism, then even if you manage to get an outsider populist, I, I call them demagogic populists, uh, not necessarily to be insulting, but because really the only way you can break through if you're a counterculture uh, is to be a completely anti-establishment, anti-political populist running against corruption. Uh, but, you know, that's the formula for now and then electing an outsider candidate, but it's not a formula for long-term structural institutional government change over many decades or generations. I suppose that leads well into a question about who you think is the audience for this book and, and what is your purpose for writing? How, do, how are you thinking about trying to reach them? You know, my purpose as an analyst uh, at this point is, I like to say, to change the climate, not the weather. It's to change the climate of ideas, right? It's not to affect the weather of politics this year, or next year, or in 10 years. So if, if I can uh, give people a clearer understanding of the trends that are going on, which I think I have, uh, you know, then that in itself is a service. Uh, other people will have to, uh, uh, who may accept my analysis, but they may have different goals. You know, uh, they can they can act on it. Uh, that's that's not my department. So you see it kind of as as putting these ideas out there, putting this analysis out there that can, uh, you know, potentially inform as we've just been discussing, uh, you know, a potential outsider cadre who could actually rebuild this this idea of democratic pluralism. Yeah, I, I think that. Uh, the present system really goes back to the 70s and 80s, where, where you get this combination of a fairly conservative free market economics in both parties, and also, frankly, identity politics in both parties. It tends, tends to emphasize race and gender more on the left. It was a kind of religious right identitarianism, and, and in some cases, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, sub uh, voce uh, white racism and, and, and others on the right. Uh, but despite the differing identities they appeal to, Clinton Democrats and Bush Republicans really pretty much agreed on, on most issues of political economy and uh, foreign policy. Uh, so I, I think this regime, it's not in its death rows, it could go on for another decade or two. Uh, but, you know, it, it really is kind of running on fumes now. Uh, if, if you have uh, Biden elected, you know, uh, we, there'd be there'd be an attempt at a restoration, but it's I, I think the uh, the gap between our legacy parties and the demands of the third decade of the 21st century just keeps growing all the time. So so at some point uh, it will be succeeded by something else. Uh, it won't be succeeded by peasants with pitchforks marching into Washington and like overthrowing everything, it, it, it will change when a large enough section of the existing establishment thinks we have to do more than simply patch this together. Right? And they will be allied with outsiders, but it will be an alliance of outsiders and insiders. Right. So that that brings the the question of kind of who's the actor who we might imagine being the actor that could actually make this happen. Um, you know, you, you can't it's hard to imagine 
you know, much of the kind of established corporate elite or or the cultural elite or something kind of wanting to to bring about this this restoration of of what you're calling democratic pluralism, kind of like cutting more people into the deal, um, f- fixing fixing the inequities in the kind of oligarchic system. Um, but someone has to go and actually build, you know, all that that institutional machinery, like you were saying, that supports uh, a, a cadre, basically a ruling cadre or a potentially ruling cadre. And, um, you know, it's hard to imagine kind of normal working people being able to do that, having, you know, in many ways being stripped of a lot, so much institutional power that it's, it's very difficult for people to build outsider institutions now. Um, so I'm just curious whether you have thoughts on, on how that could come about, who might be the actor there, what they might draw on to actually build this kind of like in, outsider institutional network. Well, I, I think that this alienated insider group, this reformist faction, uh, will be largely elected politicians and uh, government appointees, <clears throat> some career civil servants, some what we call in and outers. Uh, look, the, the people who benefit the most from the present system are corporations which have a somewhat a, a, attenuated national identity. You know, if things go south in the U.S., They've got other labor forces, you know, around the world, you know, other markets. Uh, Increasingly, uh, and this is a very disturbing trend, the corporations kind of dictate culture because they pay for more and more of the NGOs, including activist groups, and they pay for more and more of the universities, right? So I'm at the University of Texas. Uh, It's a state university, but only a minority of its money comes from the state. Much of the rest of it it's either from foundations endowed by rich individuals or by, you know, just corporate philanthropy. So, so I think uh, at the end of the day, really, the, the group, the elites that are, have an incentive, a personal incentive, no matter how cynical they may be themselves, to uh, try to help out the working class majority are people who need voters, right? Now, they can betray the voters once they're in office, but not all of them will. And, and if you're elected, and you know, politicians have real power. This is where I disagree with a lot of kind of, what I think of as simple-minded Marxism. They're not mere pawns of, of their donors. In fact, uh, I was in Washington for 30 years. Uh, the more important you are in Congress or in the executive branch, the more power you have vis-a-vis your donors. Okay, so like if you're a freshman uh, member of the House of Representatives, you may have to do whatever, you know, the great donor lobby says. Uh, if you're the head of a powerful subcommittee uh, that, that has jurisdiction over a powerful industry, you know, you can go to the industry lobby and you can say, nice little industry you have there. It'd be pity if something happened to it, the regulation. Uh, you know, so, so there's long been an argument among some political scientists that uh, high-ranking politicians, far from being pawns of uh, corporations and lobbies, uh, actually extort money from them for their own purposes, uh, which is better than being a pawn, <laughs> depending on if, what you think of their purposes. In terms of the last time there was this truce between the overclass and the working class, you describe in the book basically that uh, in the middle of the 20th century, this was uh, the, the result of an elite that saw these basically existential or at least pretty large exogenous uh, crises in the form of the world wars and the Great Depression as needing to strike a new deal in order to uh, have, I guess, a strong, a strong society that would be able to deal with, with those problems First of all, is that a fair characterization of, of, of what you think happened with the, the last time that this truce between truce and the class war, you, you could say, happened? And um, I guess, couldn't you say more about how this worked? Yeah, if that's fair. I would go further and emphasize the, the international rivalry and war part. Uh, you know, that there's this story that you had the Great Depression, there were social movements, Franklin Roosevelt came on you know, created the New Deal is, is very misleading because uh, Roosevelt's first New Deal was struck down by the courts, the National Recovery Administration. 
Uh, the second New Deal, which gave us social security, wages and hours laws and so on, was cobbled together uh, from the ruins of that, you know, between about 1935 and 1938. After that, there was a conservative coalition in Congress of Southern Democrats and Northern Republicans, which just blocked any further reform and began chipping away at what the New Deal was. So, so I, I think a lot of historians would agree if it had not been for World War II, uh, then a lot of things that we take for granted now, uh, including you know, relying on the income tax uh, you know, uh, uh, to pay for the federal government, the, the uh, New Deal before World War II was largely paid for by excise and consumption taxes, which were much more limited. Uh, you got uh, withholding, you know, of, of paychecks, you know, for Social Security and Medicare later on in the 60s, but that started with World War II. And, and the most important, as I mentioned earlier, was the unions, the big boost in the unions. Uh, it starts rising because of support from the Roosevelt administration in the 30s. But it's really World War II that, that makes them, you know, like an accepted part of American life for at least a generation. And I think this is true throughout American history. Uh, you know, the War of 1812 led to the elimination of a lot of uh, property requirements uh, for white male citizens, leading to Jacksonian democracy. Uh, the Civil War, obviously, you know, the desire not only to uh, emancipate enslaved African Americans, but also to arm them to fight for the Union, you know, uh, uh, you know, led to the destruction of slavery. Uh, the, the uh, you know, the giving 18 year olds the right to vote during the uh, Vietnam era. Uh, there's been this alliance. Uh, and the left, I think this is very uncomfortable for the left, right? Because uh, when, when, when the elite, whether it's the ancient Athenian uh, oligarchs who want to mobilize the uh, rowers in the Athenian fleet against Sparta have to give them the vote. You know, they're not, they're not, you know, doing this out of any kind of idealism. They're doing it because they need to mobilize the population for war. Uh, and consequently, if you look uh, to the, the, elsewhere in this hemisphere, to South America and Central America, where Brazil, Mexico, the Central American republics, Argentina stayed out of World War I. They kind of made, you know, declared war on the Axis right before it went under. But, but they weren't involved in the, these great uh, conflicts directly. You had very stable inegalitarian class systems because there was never incentive for the, the uh, oligarchs to arm and train uh, soldiers in mass mobilizations. So, uh, now I'm not advocating World War III in order to have social reform. I'm just pointing that out. That yeah, so that in, in the absence of that kind of thing, it's much easier for entrenched elites to simply suppress or ignore domestic discontent. Yeah, well, I guess in the in the presence of a this exogenous threat that sort of threatens. The, and tests the the strength of the entire society. The elite, the oligarchic elite, is sort of much more forced to develop a a more noblesse oblige kind of aristocratic ethos in a way, uh, and and cut more people into the deal and create a, a stronger social fabric overall. That's really interesting. And and we'll we'll see about COVID nineteen. You know, it could be that workers in in the so called essential industries in logistics, in agriculture, and in, in you know meat packing and so on, uh, you know, they really do have a certain veto power, which they may not have recognized before. And, and you know, we, we can see if that translates into greater bargaining power. The problem is you also have mass unemployment in a lot of uh, the personal service and leisure and hospitality sector that got, that, uh, got wiped out, particularly in, in cities where the affluent professional class is their, their customers. And uh, as long as employers in the essential industries can simply replace troublemakers with this uh, reserve army of the unemployed, to use Marx's term, you know, then they can undercut the bargaining power. But I, I wouldn't totally dismiss the possibility that there could be some kind, particularly if you get wave after wave of this pandemic or other pandemics. That, that you could have a new kind of social contract, at least within this essential industry sector.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a little bit disheartening to see the response to the the sort of COVID crisis, at least through the kind of beginning of this year, where it really did look like, in a lot of ways, the kind of existing elite just looted looted things a little bit harder uh, through this kind of financial crisis. It, it ended up being a sort of a transfer of wealth from from most people to. In my view, we're at the end of the beginning, not the beginning of the end. I think this could be a decade long process. Uh, and we're kind of now at the phase, you know, where a few months after the crash of 1929, you know, all the economists saying, well, you know, V-shaped recovery, things were picking up, you know, we'll be back to normal by 1930, second quarter of 1930. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it takes some time to dawn on people that, you know, this is a serious prolonged problem. And even if you get a uh, treatment and a vaccine for COVID-19, the damage that has already been done uh, to the economy is just going to ramify and, and echo for the rest of this decade, if not longer. So, so I think that there would, if, you know, if the initial backlash and opportunities for reform fail, Unfortunately, perhaps there there will be plenty more in the years to come. Right. I mean, this, this is kind of helping to answer my next question, which is, um, you know, we saw it since the mid century that that what you're calling again this democratic democratic pluralist truce has degenerated, right? And it's almost predictable, as you know, you have many of these power centers in society, but you have a few of them that are the most powerful, the most dominated by this overclass that's able to kind of uh, entrench itself and and they've ended up dismantling all these competitor institutions and you know so it only lasted a, a couple decades right and it lasted a, a generation um so i guess there's a line of questioning here in in why would it last any longer if we kind of brought it back or even how could we bring it back without kind of some huge exogenous crisis that forces the elite to to kind of step up. I'm just curious, like, if you have ideas of how to make this thing last longer and how to get there without having, you know, having to go through a disaster. Well, I, I, as I said before, I think that you have to motivate a large section of the elite to, uh, you know, engage in reform, to, to create a more inclusive system. Now, there are certain people who will do this out of a personal or class sense of noblesse oblige, uh, but they're not enough. So you really have to have uh, a group that thinks that, that they're, the elite itself, its fate is bound up in the country and will go down uh, if, you, if you don't make reform. And, and it's a harder case to make now, uh, given the fact that in you know, the New Deal period, uh, the US was more or less aut autarkic economically. I mean, you know, it was had a wall of protective tariffs. Those really didn't come down, you know, until after World War II. Uh, you know, if, if the American working class collapsed, then American capitalism would collapse. That was the source of its workers and its uh, consumers. Uh, under uh, globalized neoliberal capitalism, you know, there are um, companies which are nominally American, uh, and that they can be nominally German or Japanese as well, you know, they have access to the China market, both for consumers and for workers, you know, to the EU, you know, to uh, India increasingly in the future. So, so they're much more diversified and they're much less dependent on the health of the working class majority in any particular uh, nation state, which is why I think we, we can't think of uh, the New Deal so much as a model because there was actual uh, there, there were reformist capitalists and industrialists, you know, in the 1930s and 40s, who, you know, who realized, uh, you know, it's in our interest as members of the economic elite, you know, to help out the farmers and labor, right, and, and uh, supported the civil rights revolution later on. Uh, you know, I just think that it's harder to make that case of class self-interest in 2020, you know, than it was in 1930. There's sort of two parts to that problem. One is one is like structurally, which is, I guess, what you're getting at. The elite is sort of less tied to the fate of America. So there is actually less structural interest in 
in creating a strong society here. They are feeling less sort of tied to the ship. Um, but I think I would I would be curious to hear more uh, if you think there's problems on on the rhetorical problem as well, like not just the structural side, but also ha- is elite discourse kind of capable of uh, recognizing that structural tie if it existed, if there was a good case to be made, um, would they be would they sort of have the the kind of like tether to reality to be able to recognize it? This is a problem that I've I've heard kind of brought up. Um, you know, if you're looking at sort of the state of discourse and, and so on, it often looks like the elite is actually somewhat divorced from reality, not just kind of cynically um, lacking the incentive. Well, well, I can't tell you uh, how many members of the elite, including particular billionaires whom you would recognize, have told me over the years that they are citizens of the world. Uh, some of them told me they don't they consider themselves, you know, cosmopolitans, not citizens of America or American patriots. And there, there's, so that's a powerful viewpoint. Uh, as I point out in the new class war, they're really full of it. <laughs> because uh, in the populists, and some on the left get this wrong too, uh, the corporate elites may have access to foreign labor and to foreign consumer markets and foreign financing but they are still very, very national in character. The German capitalist class is German. There are not a whole lot of Japanese and Americans on corporate boards. The the American corporate boards are a bit more diverse and have more uh, uh, immigrants and and sometimes non-citizens. It's still very American, right? So so the way I see it, you essentially have this group of uh, American elites, just to look at the US, who are completely deeply rooted in the United States. I mean, if you drop them in Tokyo, they would be hopeless. I'm sorry, you know, or, or in Berlin, you know, but they're, they're in their own minds, they think, oh, I'm post-American, I'm part of this, you know, emerging global society, uh, you know, because I watch foreign movies, you know, and I travel, you know, to Asia and Europe for vacation and so on. Uh, and I think in a way, it's kind of you know like a, a form of false consciousness. I don't think they're doing this deliberately just to trick people, but the fact is, you know, kind of like uh, Moliere's a bourgeois gentleman, you know, who's speaking prose even though he, he thinks he's speaking poetry. Uh, you know, these people are speaking cosmopolitanism while being quite nationalistic in in practice. So yeah. So, so, so in a way, it kind of serves as an alibi for ignoring the rest of society, but it's an alibi they believe quite sincerely. Yeah, it's just interesting, like that that cosmopolitan posture, the post-nationalist posture um, itself kind of is just, um, that's just the American kind of international influence, right? And if you imagine that America's international influence actually collapsed, if America was actually existentially threatened or, or some kind of existential threat to America's geopolitical power came through, I guess, as you're saying, a lot of that stuff just falls through. Uh, the rest of the world gets carved up by these other entities like China and Japan and Germany and Russia um, and, and so on. And and like, you know, it might feel very post-national, you know, within the American sphere, but that is actually just the American sphere. Um, and I think, you know, in some sense, we do have kind of a resurgence of, of that geopolitical uh, logic of the state kind of coming through right now with the rise of China, with kind of people becoming more aware of uh, the waning influence of, of the United States and, and just how kind of tethered we are to our kind of existing military and economic power structures. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think it actually will help the populist right more, more than, um, let's say, the social democratic uh, left. You know, one of the things I've, I've spent a fair amount of time abroad, what, what I try to do when I'm in a new country is to go outside of the downtown tourist district. I mean, it can be Vienna, it can be Mexico City, you know, it can be Tokyo, whatever. And what I've always found is, even in these big uh, multicultural global cities, you you walk a few blocks out of the well-traveled tourist district, and you are in a society where nobody speaks English, where they're mostly blue collar workers, you know, or service sector workers, you know, uh, often, 
a generation or two from rural peasant families. Uh, and, and this is true in developed countries, right? This is true in Europe. It's true in North America. It's true in Japan. Like we, we say, you know, capitalist countries, there are no capitalist countries in terms of the people. Uh, what, what happened was we went from a society of peasant countries to uh, the 21st century where you have more and more proletarian countries. That is people who make their livings as wage earners and don't own significant amounts of uh, property. So really strictly speaking, uh, the US, Germany, France, Japan, these are proletarian societies. Uh, and you know, uh, the left managed to mobilize this majority of uh, proletarians defined in that sense, uh, both through uh, socialist or social democratic uh, membership parties and also through unions. Uh, I think one of the reasons the right has done so well uh, in, in the US and even in places like Brazil, uh, when, when the left-wing unions and the left-wing parties disintegrate, uh, what organizations exist that bring together working class people of, of different races, you know, on a say weekly basis? It's religious congregations. So that you see in, uh, uh, in Brazil, the Pentecostals, you know, are an increasing force. Uh, as, as a lot of Brazilians uh, defect from Catholicism to this kind of American-inspired Pentecostal religion. Uh, you see why, and, and I think a lot of the left gets the right wrong, that is, the, the core of the right in the U.S., it's not white nationalists like neo-Nazi people who say the, you know, the code word for A.H., Adolf Hitler, or whatever. There's a tiny little group of those people. Uh, although obviously they're racist attitudes, the muscle is the evangelical churches. Uh, and that was also true uh, for the African-American community. And, and to some degree, uh, I haven't looked into it closely, but I suspect that this helped uh, Biden uh, win the Democratic nomination because when the unions are gone and the parties are gone as membership organizations, paradoxically, even in an advanced industrial society that is becoming more secular overall, the, the actual organizations that can bus people to the voting polls tend to become, tend to be religious congregations. And, and it gives them kind of a greater power than they had even in the past, just by default, because they can organize and mobilize uh, ordinary people. Hmm. Great, this is really interesting, but let's go to the um, Q and A from the audience. So there's a few good questions here. Start with Samuel Buria asks, how can outsiders build records of public service? What kind of organizations fit the bill as employers? This is related to our previous discussion about the kind of outsider cadre. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, in the new class where I argue that uh, the executive branch and the uh, judiciary tend to be the most overclass dominated and particularly the judiciary. I think everyone now in the Supreme Court went to either Harvard or Yale, right? And, you know, a lot of them went to prep schools. This is the most aristocratic branch. Uh, you know, the, the higher ranking executive cabinet agencies uh, are also very elitist. Uh, so the, the, it's actually the legislative branch. It's Congress and congressional staffs and uh, state legislatures where I think that uh, you have more of a chance. The entry barriers are lower uh, if you did not get an Ivy League, you know, credential uh, you know, and, and, you know, didn't go to a prep school or something. Uh, and the good news is in the United States that uh, congressional staffs in particular, but also state legislative staffs form a kind of farm team, a funnel to executive organizations. So like there's, you know, two, two ways you can, you know, get into a cabinet agency. You know, one is you have a great degree from a public policy school like mine, the, you know, the LBJ School of Public Affairs and a master's degree and so on. The other is uh, you work your way up on, let's say, the environmental subcommittee in the House. And then when your president gets elected, you know, then you go into the EPA. So, uh, so I think to, to build up th these credentialed cadres, I think you want a, a kind of a legislative staff strategy. That's really interesting. Thank you. Our next question from Nico. Uh, Nico asks, 
how do you reconcile the seating of power of the traditional bourgeoisie to managers with the fact that most bureaucratically advanced corporations, Amazon and Walmart, have direct private owners? Uh, that's another excellent question. Uh, in, in the book, I have to do it from 30,000 feet because I'm looking both at Western Europe and at the US. Uh, but one of the peculiarities of the United States version of capitalism uh, is, uh, and this is a recent thing, it's really just you know, from the, the tech era of the 80s and 90s onwards, you get the outsized role of these uh, founding entrepreneurs. Uh, many of them, like the uh, Google boys uh, and, and Mark Zuckerberg, arranged share ownership you know, to have their personal control. So this is something that we haven't really seen uh, since the days of Andrew Carnegie and, and Ford and Rockefeller, you know, in, in the uh, automobile steel and oil industry. Uh, I think it's a passing phase uh, in the US. That is, until we get another uh, wave of radical technological innovation, which does not seem to be on the horizon anytime soon, what you're seeing is we're seeing the maturing of the information technologies, which were largely, you know, kind of complete by the 80s and 90s after a long uh, a period of prehistory from the 1930s and 40s all the way up, you know, to the 80s and 90s. And you're seeing with information technology what you saw with the uh, previous wave of automobile and steel and uh, petroleum technology. You get initially, you get hundreds of uh, entrepreneurs, uh, and then there's a Darwinian process that weeds them out to a few large corporations. And once the founding generation leaves the scene, uh, then the professional managers take over. Uh, so I think that will happen in the US. In Japan and in Germany, it's quite different. You, you, you've always had this kind of uninterrupted uh, professional management to a much greater degree than you do in the US. You don't have you know, these kind of uh, IPO tycoons. You know, that's, that's a kind of a unique American thing. But at the same time, you have in Germany and Japan more kind of long term family ownership as well of these large corporations. Yeah, that's right. And one of the interesting things about Japan and Germany is uh, there was all this triumphalism about the Anglo American capitalist model compared to the non liberal German and Japanese model. Uh, and, and we were more dynamic and they were sclerotic and so on. Uh, but it turns out that what has typically been seen as, as this kind of dead end version of capitalism, which uh, Wolfgang Strick calls a, a non-liberal capitalism uh, in Germany and to some degree in Japan, where you, you've got this kind of gradual evolution of craft guilds and apprenticeships and these kind of medieval labor institutions into modern labor institutions, which you didn't have in the US or UK. And you also had like Germany's uh, Mittelstand corporations, you, you had these sometimes fairly substantial family owned corporations where they engaged in long term planning because they wanted this to be a going concern for, for their descendants. So, so it's a very interesting question now. It's, it's a good time to revisit that debate in the 1990s and ask uh, is the UK US version of capitalism the most extreme neoliberal version? you know, really that much more sustainable or innovative uh, in the long term uh, than, than these other models. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I just have another follow up on on this line of talking, which is these these kind of founder billionaires, uh, you know, we had we saw them previously with with the, the kind of oil and steel and, and aviation and so on. But now we have the latest generation with with Amazon and SpaceX and and Facebook and so on. Um, these guys do seem to sort of stand out from the sort of managerial class. And in fact, they seem to often um, in some way have a tension with, with the managerial class. Do you see them as a possible kind of part of that outsider elite that could uh, help help drive sort of a change away from, from the managerial system? Um, like, could they be, could they be part of that? And what would that look like? Or, or are they kind of like, just on their way out, they're not really going to be relevant? I'm curious. Well, 
let me put it this way. Uh, I use a kind of a sociological definition of class as the class you were born into and raised in. It's not how much money you make at any given moment. Uh, so if you look at, with the exception of the Walton family, you know, you know, you know, the Hilton heirs and so on. They, I mean, they're all money families. But, but if you look at Michael Bloomberg, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, Bill Gates, uh, they're, they're part of the upper middle class, you know, what I call the managerial professional overclass, uh, who just happen to get obscenely rich, right? But, but uh, they're not part of like a separate class. I don't, that's why I don't think you can talk about billionaires as a separate class. You know, billionaires are just upper middle class lawyers and corporate executives and others who just, you know, founded a, a global corporation. Uh, but that doesn't make them a separate class, you know, like the British aristocracy distinct from the tradesmen or something. Uh, so uh, now can you get enlightened philanthropists who uh, side with uh, ordinary people? Uh, well, yeah, I think you can. Uh, I mean, there's a long history of that, you know, on, in terms of individuals, in families, you know, the Roosevelt's, there's a kind of a Tory patrician yeah. tradition you, you find in many societies. Uh, and in some ways, uh, you're more likely to find allies of the outsiders of the working class among people born to money rather than people who made it, you know, kind of for obvious reasons, right? Because if you inherited it, you may or may not have a sense of noblesse oblige, but if you spent the first 40 or, you know, 30 or 40 years of your life, uh, essentially, you know, trying to minimize the, the compensation of your workers, right? you know, and skirt government regulations to become a billionaire, you know, then, then you know, suddenly becoming, you know, a pro working class tribune in your 50s or 60s, I, I think it's, it's a bit more difficult. It, it may happen, uh, but I wouldn't count on it. Interesting. Pasha asks, is there space for unions today? Would a hypothetical technology workers union succeed at improving labor practices or would it get hijacked by unrelated political issues? Um, as a follow on, Ash uh, asks, why is Michael pessimistic about traditional labor practices like strikes, especially given current protests and social upheavals? Well, let me answer the, the follow on first. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm pessimistic about strikes where you don't have uh, veto points. Where, where a strike can paralyze an industry. So for example, if, if you look where, at where some labor unions have done well in the last 20 or 30 years, one place is Las Vegas, right? Because if, if the hotel workers go on strike, you know, then it just shuts down, you know, the whole entertainment city model. Uh, and that was true of uh, concentrated factories in the past. Uh, so I, I think you actually need different strategies of organized labor for different sectors. Uh, and this is not original with me, it goes back to, you know, 100 years. Uh, so for example, early 20th century, the labor reformers wanted traditional unions that can have paralyzing strikes in uh, mass production industries. You can shut it down, right? That gives you your bargaining power. But they recognized that there were what were called the sweated trades, uh, which in those days were largely piecework, uh, often by women, uh, from their houses. That is, uh, they, they would be given jobs of sewing, right? You know, and then they would, would you know, work on these sewing assignments and turn them in for money. Uh, and it was almost impossible to organize, you know, this very distributed, you know, part-time workforce. And, and the solution, which was adopted in the UK and, and, and some states in the United States, including New York, uh, where it was revived recently by uh, Andrew Cuomo uh, to help out uh, fast food workers. It's what is called a wage board. That is, you appoint representatives of labor from that sector to a government commission, along with uh, representatives of business, government, sometimes consumers. And they just, so instead of having collective bargaining between the union and uh, work uh, employers, this wage board just sets the standards. It, it sets the hours you know, the compensation, uh, the treatments. So, so I think you need multiple kinds of labor organization, each appropriate to its own economic sector. Another question 
This one from Ryan Karana. He asks, to what degree is the decline of, re- of the retail investor and the rise of institutional investors who own significant amount of the shares in many firms across the same industry changing the analysis of uh, Burnham et al.? Like as, as you get these more concentrated investors, is that changing the logic at all? It may or may not. You know, as I say, I'm not convinced uh, by the argument that uh, mutual funds and, and you know concentrate investors and so on are are really pushing a lot of the flaws of U.S. capitalism in particular. I think that that kind of gets the managers themselves uh, off the hook. Uh, you know, ha- having said that, uh, if concentrated if these concentrated investors took a long term interest in the well being of the country then they could actually discipline uh, errant managers, you know, to, uh, to do the right thing to their workforces. You know, one of the ironies of American history is we had a much more quote unquote German system uh, between the 1890s when you had a wave of consolidation that produced uh, the major industrial corporations for the first time in the 1930s when you had the New Deal reforms. Uh, and I say German because in the US, of the 1900s, you had J.P. Morgan and other financiers had their agents sitting on the boards of American corporations, the way uh, universal banks in Germany to some degree do to this day. Uh, And that actually aligned the view of the banks uh, with with the uh, corporations. So so J.P. Morgan thought more like an industrial capitalist than Jamie Dimon does. Right, because he and his allies owned the railroads and they owned the steel industry and so on. And so that, and because they were concentrated and powerful, they could prevent the CEOs, the managers, from running amok, right? Uh, and, and also because they were long term investors, right? They weren't just trying to squeeze dividends you know, out of a company, you know, like corporate raiders and then toss it aside. Uh, so, so, you know, industrial capitalism in the modern form is about 140 years old, goes back to the 1880s, 1890s. Uh, it's been tried in different phases in pre-New Deal, post-New Deal, neoliberal in the U.S., you know, in Western Europe and East Asia. So I think it's a work in progress, you know, and, and who knows? I do, I, I fail to answer the earlier other question, I want to address it. Uh, I, th- I think organized labor should really be nonpartisan and really selfish. That is, I think it should focus on a small number of issues like wages and benefits and working conditions. And, and I think that uh, when other causes, uh, mostly progressive, come along uh, and say, well, we want you to be part of this alliance, you know, I think they should say, well, as individuals, we'll join your alliance, but as a labor organization, we're not Democrats, we're not Republicans, you know, we're not part of a party. Uh, we will reward any legislators who support us and punish any politicians who oppose us, and we don't care what their views are on other issues. I mean, this was the view of Samuel Gompers and the American Federation of Labor. Uh, they were nonpartisan. We will support our friends and punish our enemies. Uh, and now most of them were also socialists and social progressives and so on, you know, but, you know, there are different organizations for different purposes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, we have a question from Isaac Wilkes. How would one build a regime of democratic pluralism that was less prone to the destruction via management or other sort of class war problems? within that structure of compromise is class conflict within such a system of compromise inevitable this is kind of related to to some of the questions we were asking earlier with like how how do you actually set up the institutional framework that can more permanently uh keep the compromise going i I do think class conflict is inevitable in industrial societies of the kind that will be worldwide by the end of the century everywhere even in the developing countries so, so we're at the beginning of industrial civilization, you know, not, not nearing some radical change. The change is partly behind us into this new system. 
So the purpose of democratic pluralism, as I define it, particularly in the economic realm, is not to get rid of class conflict. It is to channel it constructively by giving both sides the power to, of, uh, to have negotiations. And I don't want uh, the labor movement to become so strong that if it's misguided, it, it chokes off and destroys the managerial elite. I mean, they would, we have to have a managerial elite. You know, the labor movement would have to support it itself if it wanted it. So, so you know, the view I'm, I, this, is, this is denounced by certain Marxists as class collaborationism. That's what I am, a class collaborationist. They fight first, right? You know, but, but they, they do try to work out temporary truces. And then if that doesn't work, they fight again. And then you have another temporary truce. And classical socialism wants to end the class conflict by getting rid of the capitalists, or in this case, the managers. Uh, neoliberalism basically wants to get rid of the workers by refining, redefining everybody as a capitalist. We're all going to be capitalists. We're all going to be entrepreneurs, right? Every child, you know, has human capital. It's like your personal capital asset that you will cultivate, you know, we'll have 320 million entrepreneurs. I think that's essentially the neoliberal vision on, on the center right and the center, center left, isn't it? Interesting. Well, some people have proposed kind of a, a party of the state that would be necessary to kind of sit above these other classes and, and integrate their interests into a more cohesive whole. Like if it's just this kind of horizontal conflict, it's very hard to see how that might uh, come out uh, towards any kind of holistic good and and sort of in, in your own analysis, looking at uh, the war as this existential pressure that that um, kind of raises the logic of the state and of society overall to that highest position. That's kind of what created the pluralism in the first place. Um, so some people have, have sort of proposed that, that that's um, we have some people saying this in the chat, that, that that's what um, what would be necessary is kind of this this uh, and more explicitly state-oriented um, institutional line of thought that, that would be able to discipline the other classes. Yeah, I'm kind of skeptical about that. That is, uh, you know, there have been fairly autonomous states uh, where if you look at, let's say, Bismarcky in Germany, where it was essentially the Junker class of aristocratic soldiers, uh, and they weren't capitalists, and they weren't workers, and they could kind of broker conflicts, you know, but they were you know, East Prussian rural landowners, right? You know, I, I don't think you're going to get this in the modern U.S. So, so that's why I go back to my answer earlier. I think it has to be politicians. They have to be answerable to the working class majority. Uh, and, and in a way, the politicians kind of have to be the union for the working class majority. They have to be the union leaders themselves, the organized labor leaders. Because I, I think going forward, uh, we're not going to have autarkic national capitalism. We may have somewhat more economic nationalism, but uh, corporations and banks are always going to have the option to some degree of pitting nation states against each other, right? So, so I, I see it more, as I, it, it, you know, in the 19th century, when you had largely autarkic economies, you could have kind of an autonomous state balancing you know, management and labor. But now I see it more like it's, it's, a, it's a developmental state, right? Where the working class is stuck. They're stuck in the US, they're stuck in China, they're stuck in Poland, they're stuck in Namibia. They're not going anywhere, right? Uh, capital, you know, technology, corporations, they can go anywhere. So, you know, I, I think part of this is you have to look at the model of developmental states, both developing countries and economic development programs in the US, where on the one hand, you're actually trying to lure global rootless finance and in industries, which could be somewhere else. You're trying to attract them to your country. Uh, at the same time, you're putting conditions on those, those uh, investors and those corporations. You're saying, you know, we'll help you out, we'll have subsidies, we'll have infrastructure, you know, we'll have training programs. But on the other hand, you have to create a certain number of jobs in our nation, right? Or our you know, county or our city. Uh, you know, you, you have to obey 
you know, our national labor standards. You may have to negotiate with organized uh, representatives of labor that we designate. So it's, it's kind of a different model from the New Deal, which really was more of, you know, the impartial state as a broker between management and labor. It, it, it's more like a developing country or a, a state of the United States trying to accomplish these things, both on behalf of its own citizens, uh, but, but also, you know, uh, uh, offering something positive to investors mm -hmm. and corporations. Right. So you have those politicians kind of operating on that, that holistic developmentalist logic, having to uh, discipline the other things. Chris asks uh, or writes, the extent of cultural fragmentation among this essential worker class has gone up and down over time. It seems to be relatively high right now, similar to, if not greater than the levels of fragmentation in the 1880s to 1920s period. Is this conceivably a reason why we don't see large scale essential worker unionization efforts? All such efforts in recent times, that is, fast food workers, union, etc., seem to have completely failed quickly, though admittedly, admittedly there have been some gains, for instance, incremental minimum wage increases in a variety of cities and states. No, no I, think, I don't think that cultural division is the main cause of uh, the weakness of, of labor organizing in the U.S. I think that's just the laws and the, the agencies are stacked against it. Uh, and also equally important is the factor I said earlier, a lot of these industries in, in which Americans work now, particularly a leisure and hospitality and recreation, uh, have lots of little small firms that are very fragile as we discovered with uh, COVID-19. They don't make big profits to share with workers. They're hard to organize. So, so I, I think there are other, uh, structural problems with, with having labor organization apart from cultural divisions within the working class. Where those cultural divisions are important is in politics, right? Because you have both parties essentially appealing to their bases. The parties are closely divided enough, uh, the Republicans and the Democrats, at least on the national level. They think that if we can really make our base angry and turn them out, in the next election, then we can defeat the other side 51-49. Uh, and, but you do that by scaring the hell out of your base, right? You say if the Democrats will win, they will abolish Christianity, right? You know, if the Republicans win, they're gonna, it's back to Bull Connor and, you know, segregation. Uh, and, and that affects the social democratic aspect of the state because if, you know, the first question that people ask if you propose more public spending, and that has to be part of it, and programs, will this benefit their team or our team? And if it disproportionately benefits this team that you de demonized, you know, then, well, we don't want this, right? So, so I think the culture of war uh, is stoked for political reasons. And, and I also disagree with the questioner uh, this country was much more divided in the 1890s. I mean, I'm 58 years old. It was much more divided when I was in college, you know, along regional lines and racial lines, religion, uh, than, than it is now, you know. Uh, uh, you know, so, so I, I think to some degree, uh, there are real cultural divides, but because of this 5149 national political system we have now, both parties are, are deliberately pouring gasoline on them. Now, this will differ if one party has a clear, enduring majority. At that point, uh, it, it's, it's, its electoral strategy is not mobilizing its own base, right? I mean, they're more relaxed. They can reach out to the other side. The minority party, if it's a permanent minority, wants to get things done, right? They're kind of like the Republicans between uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Newt Gingrich. You know, they play nice with the Democrats a lot of the time because they want to get things done. So, so I, I think this polarization is probably a temporary uh, aspect of, of the political system. Um, through most of American history, you've not had this very narrow knife edge, you know, control of the White House. And the Democrats would have had a consistent presidential majority, right, if it weren't for the Electoral College with uh, Bush and, and uh, 
2000 and then with Trump in 2016. Samo has another interesting question. Is there a way to communicate to the very, the very American interests uh, to the technology billionaires and, and other elites who see themselves as sim citizens of the world? How do we reach that? Well, for historical reasons, and I know some of these people, uh, you know, they, they grew up in, like much of the upper middle class, managerial lower class, they grew up in, in the period of, of neoliberalism at its height you know, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, where unions were passe, you know, uh, we're against cultural conservatism, you know, the future is this, this planetary society where we sit on an island. There used to be, back in the 90s, I remember there was a commercial, you know, on, on all of the PBS shows showing uh, this, uh, this guy you know, sitting under a palm tree on an island with this computer, everything. It, it came about actually as a result of COVID-19 <laughs> and Zoom, ironically. Uh, but, but so they just grew up with this very libertarian ethos. Uh, and they were radically different from the first one or two generations of tech people who were these IBM company men. I mean, they were mostly men in those days, you know, and it was this this very conformist, careerist kind of bureaucratic managerial culture. Uh, so, so I just think, you know, uh, uh, this particular generation, this generation of founders are mostly libertarians, more or less, right? They're kind of anti-union, you know, free markets, socially liberal, they're, you know, pro-gay rights, pro-choice and so on. Uh, and you know, as, as someone in middle age myself, it's kind of hard to change, you know, one's opinions after a certain, after a certain uh, birthday. So I think you have to kind of wait for a uh, younger generation to come along. And I think there will be a swing, not back towards stuffy patriarchal IBM bureaucracy, but, but I think you're seeing a swing both on the left and the right, you know, towards uh, some kind of more communitarian sense, right? That just like doing what you absolutely personally want to do, you know, against all uh, restraint, whether in, in, in any sphere, is not necessarily a formula for a successful society. Yeah, for sure. We've definitely seen that a lot under, under sort of in the younger generations. Um, you know, Gen X tended to be a lot more libertarian. The millennials do seem to have more of that like communica communitarian logic one way or another whether it's sort of traditional or, or some kind of uh, more left-wing ethos. We have another question from Ryan. He asks, is corporate power still unified? Much of the cultural power corporations are exerting today doesn't seem to be coming from executives who seem to be afraid of the backlash from their HR and marketing departments who control a lot of the voice and brand that the company has. I think it's true, but I think the power of these departments uh, essentially is the fact that these CEOs are so out of touch that they actually think that this is what the, the public, their consumers, at the end of the day, they're going to do what their consumers want, right? So in the 1990s, uh, I was in journalism. Uh, you know, all of the major magazines like Newsweek and so on, uh, would do these Christmas issues because so much of their uh, readership was Christians, right? And they would do like the story of Jesus and the Holy Land. And it was all stuff which no actual biblical scholar has believed for a hundred years, right? But that was their audience, right? You know, I, I think they now have concluded that the mass public is actually more liberal uh, on these cultural issues than it, than it really is. Uh, and why, how would they know otherwise? I mean, like they go back and forth from Aspen to the Hamptons, you know, to, to their Wyoming ranches and they ask some 28 year old, right? It's like, well, what's the pulse of the young people, right? You know, and they say, oh, intersectional identity politics. It's like, well, you know, do something about it, right? So <laughs> I don't think these are terribly liberal individuals, uh, you know, and, but, but I, I do think that's gonna be a problem. Uh, you know, for these corporations uh, going forward, because, uh, you know, you, you now see uh, 
this backlash among what used to be their supporters on the right, you know, where uh, they're, they're now seeing the corporations with some justification as aligning themselves with, you know, the campus left, right? And now some of the people on the right are living in a fantasy world in which, you know, uh, you still have small town devout church going America, that's gone in 2020. Uh, but but I, I, I think that, you know, really, this is the problem with having excessive centralization of the media and the culture and, and uh, uh, corporations. Uh, you don't have like provincial elites or, you know, labor union local people to, to like, that you could ask in the old days, right? You know, if you're John D. Rockefeller, you could ask, you know, the head of the labor union, you could ask, you know, the head of the First Baptist Church, like, what's the mood on the streets? Now, if the people you are asking are the college professor and the uh, nonprofit activist, and I've been both a college professor and a nonprofit person, and they're, they're actually funded by you, right? <laughs> There's a certain informational problem with that setup, you know, if, if you're trying to, you know, to get, you know, real information about what's going on in society from outside of some kind of bubble echo chamber. We've got another question from Chris Rebotham. He says, my understanding is that despite their origin as somewhat ruthless capitalists of the minimized workers' wages and skirt government regulations type, um, men like Carnegie and Rockefeller became celebrated philanthropists partly out of a desire to ascend to a higher social class, like to uh, assimilate into an existing social elite. And so he asks, is it that we have a shortage of noblesse oblige among the new rich, or is it merely that the nature of the social elite into which these self-made billionaires are assimilating has fundamentally changed? Well, that's a very important point, you know, and it goes to the point I had earlier about the uh, Tory reformers, because up until fairly recently, uh, people who made money, uh, let's just say in the U.S. and the U.K., they did not want to, they wanted to turn themselves into aristocrats. There was, there were still old money families. There were still old landed aristocratic titled families. And the first thing you did, if you, like, like Carnegie, right? He was genuinely poor immigrant and worked his way up, you know, uh, and then he becomes a billionaire by today's standards. And he goes to, you know, Scotland and, and England and shoots grouse, right? With the title nobility, right? Now the title nobility are pretty much gone. As I said, there are old money families and they're more important than you might think, particularly on the Republican side. Republicans are an old money party, much more than the Democrats are. Uh, but, but so that's, that's like a real problem, right? Because, uh, you know, there's, there's no existing class identified with noblesse oblige to which you can emulate even totally hypocritically for purely egotistical purposes, right? To some degree, there's kind of this attenuated philanthropical tradition. And I, I won't dismiss this, right? You know, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, right? Giving money to fight malaria in Africa, things like that. You know, it's, it's like charity. Uh, but, but you notice it's what uh, Dickens, in, in one of his novels, he had a character, Mrs. Jellyby, who was uh, guilty of a telescopic charity. Uh, she, she saw distant suffering uh, much more intensely than the suffering all around her in her own house, in her own neighborhood, <laughs> right? So, uh, so I do think there's a problem with our existing elite, uh, you know, that while they're ignoring things like wage theft, right? And, uh, you know, uh, non-fixed schedules and, you know, huge healthcare bills that just ruin the lives of, of tens of millions of American workers, you know, but they think, well, I've got all this money, I can do the most good in a utilitarian sense, you know, to the poorest people in other continents, right? With like the most pressing problems and, you know, and that's okay. 
but like try to help out your own workers a little bit sometimes. Yeah, well, like in terms of the different types of noblesse oblige, that telescopic versus a more local type, one of the interesting differences there is one of those actually ends up going back and building a strong society that becomes a base for kind of further uh, charity, you know, beyond that society, whereas one, the other one kind of attenuates the wealth of that society into the more direct charitable projects. And, and so that's kind of an interesting, an interesting difference. We've moved more towards that telescopic, disconnected, under like unrooted mode of charity, which um, ends up actually weakening uh, the underlying society by by neglect in a way. Yeah, and 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 so this, I guess, the construction of like a positive noblesse oblige is really the the central thing we're coming around. We're, we're sort of circling around here is like, how do we actually do that, right? We've talked about the um, the logic of the state. We've talked about kind of the the class interest of of the elite as they realize that they are in fact tethered to the health of society. We've talked about sort of these these just more like status seeking motivations like people trying to ascend into a higher more aristocratic class um so there's sort of all these different routes by which people come to this kind of noblesse oblige which is this i guess desire to kind of govern society well and and cut everybody into a more pluralistic deal um i guess i'm just curious to hear what I mean, you know, but having having discussed all these factors, like how do you how do you see this like most plausibly happening? And and do you think that's a fair characterization of like the core issue here is this, this concept of yeah, I think I think it is, and uh, you know, this is a fairly new development, uh, and it has to do with this uh, meritocratic neoliberalism as the dominant ideology, rather than uh, so. If you look at the New Deal period all the way up to the 60s and 70s. The promise of American life was not that you would become a college educated professional, that you would found your own business, become an entrepreneur. It was that you would have a good job for good wages with good hours, thanks to your union. Uh, and your, your living standard would rise over time with productivity in the economy without you doing anything. You just worked, you know, a certain number of hours a week. And over time, thanks to technological innovation, but growing prosperity, you and your family would, would be better off. And you did not need intergenerational mobility, okay? So, you know, like if, if you worked, you know, in the textile company, you know, or, or the automobile company, whether you're male or female, your kids and grandkids could follow you in that working class trade, assuming it wasn't eliminated by robots, uh, and have good lives, right? And at some point, this took place in my life because I was born into that world in the early 1960s. At some point uh, between the 70s and the 90s, that narrative of the American dream got replaced by the you too can be a millionaire, right? Uh, so essentially it comes in two versions. There's the Republican version, you too can found your own business and become obscenely rich. And then there's the neoliberal democratic version, which is you too can go to Harvard or Yale and Princeton uh, and become a successful career professional and sit on corporate boards, right? So, so the, the, the center left version is a bit more academic and professional and the center right version is more money oriented but there's no room in either of those visions for being a grocery store clerk or a janitor, right? Or a trucker or a nurse, even though those are most of the jobs that are being created, right? So I think part of the alienation you see in, in American society now is basically, and, and the thing is they actually, these groups think they, they are helping ordinary people to escape from the working class. But the problem is almost all jobs are working class and will be working class uh, in 100 years. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, I think there are only two out of 10 of the most of the, the most numerous jobs being created that require anything beyond high school and on the job training. It's like people don't need more human capital. They don't need higher education. They need more money. <laughs> <laughs> 
They need higher wages. They need health care so they're not bankrupted by medical bills, right? And that was that was the vision to some degree in the, the 40s and 50s and 60s. It's not now. We have this very individualized vision where, uh, you know, to the extent that we can, uh, we will create a perfectly meritocratic society so that no matter the class of your parents, no matter how poor, uh, you will have exactly the same opportunity as people born into old money families who are like third generation Yaleys or Princetonians. Well, that's not going to happen, right? So I think on the one hand, and this is this is why my book is radical, and, 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 and probably the reviewers have not caught on how radical it is, uh, because we, basically what I'm saying is, admit that we have a class system that is not going away, and that you can be a good, dignified person and have a good life as a working class person. You can also have a good life as a member of the managerial elite, right? And and the classes, as long as the working class has countervailing power, can work out deals acceptable to themselves. So the flip side of saying it's okay to be working class is saying it's okay to be old money, right? It's okay, you, you know, I mean, What's the point? I mean, obviously, you went to better schools and got into better education and, you know, connections with your family and just the general cult. You have all these advantages, all right? Well, you can come up with class privilege as opposed to white privilege and kind of virtue signal by saying, oh, it's terrible. I'm a Rockefeller, you know. It's terrible. I'm a Carnegie. Uh, or you say, okay, you know, I have this, you know, greater privilege, so... I'm going to repay it, you know, to society. And, uh, and then society will judge, you won't, whether you're seriously doing this or if this is just, you know, kind of an ego trip. Yeah, it's interesting how the self-denunciation almost is a substitute for actual noblesse oblige in that sense. Well, there's somebody, I've forgotten his name, he's come up with a concept of luxury beliefs. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like Thorstein Veblen's conspicuous consumption. You have your conspicuous beliefs that show you're a good person. And, you know, actions speak louder than words. What you said about meritocracy or sort of the uh, the virtue there um, or, or the vice um, it reminds me of Christopher Lash, and, uh, who, who I know you quote in the book a few times, um, this idea that in some ways the 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 meritocratic or or faux meritocratic element universal meritocratic element of professional managerial overclass is perhaps the most insidious part it, you kind of get the worst of both worlds because you get both a, uh, a class that is still elite um but that doesn't view itself as having those type of obligations that sort of um, thinks that it, it deserves everything that it, it, yeah, it it's really insidious because the the premise is that in practice if you're from the lowest quintile of the income distribution uh you you can have i quote this in, in my book that is high scoring math students from low socioeconomic backgrounds are less likely to finish college than people who are really bad at math from well-to-do upper middle class affluent families okay now, unless you acknowledge that, you're basically saying, we have a perfectly fair system. Uh, and if you didn't get, get into these good schools, and if you, know, you didn't get these great professional jobs, which are maybe 20% of the jobs, then you are a personal failure. You're inferior, right? You failed, right? It was, uh, and, and there's kind of a center left version of this, which is, well, it's rigged now, but with this tax credit, right, or that school reform, by the year 2030, there will be a perfect meritocracy, right? You know, and so my message is, uh, I don't care what society it is, you're gonna, you have these modern managerial elites in urban industrial civilization. Uh, the children of communist princelings in, in China uh, inherited a lot of their connections in the party from their parents and grandparents who fought with Mao and are much richer than other Chinese. 
uh, you know, there's a certain amount of social mobility, but there are going to be lots of princeling families in China in 2100, right? You know, there, and, and so, so, you know, to me, the radical thing about my book is to say, okay, what if we focus less on opening up the 20% elite? I mean, I do want to open it up. I support most measures to make it more meritocratic, but, but that wouldn't be the priority. The priority is what if we help working class people with the educations they have now, the jobs they have now, make more money and have more benefits and also have more power, which if you're working class, the power can only come through numbers because you don't have individual wealth, you don't have personal connections. So, so uh, you have to have organizations, right? To magnify individual workers' power, uh, wage earners' power. Yeah, I mean, to, to, um, to summarize what you were saying earlier, like it's this interesting transformation in our conception of the American dream. You know, what we want is something where you know, everybody can be part of the society and have a comfortable place that's improving over time in the society. And and the, the dream we've sort of ended up with in some way is that like, well, the American dream is that you can escape from the society. You, you can be one of the lucky few who like gets rich and manages to escape. It's, yeah, so I, bringing back that conception of like, you know, having a, having a comfortable place in society is interesting. Right. Charlie in the, the chocolate factory, you know, you get your golden ticket and then mm -hmm. you escape and you inherit Willy Wonka's factory, right? You mm -hmm. leave your poor relatives behind. You know? <laughs> well, I think this is a good place to wrap up. This has been a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, very much enjoyed talking to you. Well, thank you. It's been a privilege. Yeah. So, and, and thanks, thanks again to the audience for joining us. Um, and, you know, we'd love to continue this discussion in the future. Uh, just to remind you all, Michael Lynn's new book is The New Class War, Saving Democracy from the Managerial Elite. It's available now. Um, and thanks to the audience for good questions, of course. Uh, we had some good ones today. And special thanks to all our Palladium members. To become a member get in, and get invited to our upcoming salons, visit us at palladiummag.com slash subscribe. Uh, subscribe to the Palladium Magazine channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at Palladium Mag. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time.